This video is about my concept Haya. Um, and this is the sort of foundational concept of my theology. Foundation is definitely the wrong word. The basic idea is that there is a Trinitarian Godhead and the names of the three persons of the Trinity are Hak, Olalan, and, and uh, Light. And then there is a fourth person of the Godhead that is in a way not a part of the Godhead at all. And it's, it's essentially you know, it's a name, Heil is a name for nothingness, or non-being, or non-sense, uh, non-existence. And the thing about this entity, this item, is that its ontological status, by virtue of what it is, is actually really unstable and in question. So this may be a name kind of rigid designator for something that is not there. And I'm bringing up this concept because it's the, it's currently the third decan of Aries, it's April 14th, and um, that's what Heil is assigned to in Transcendental Kabbalah, and it happens to be the week of Easter, so that's a great time to um, like kick off a series. So the first point I'll make about this is that what I have in mind is that which uh, there's an attempt to approach um, with the concept of negation in German idealism and the concept of difference in French post-structuralism, um, those being kind of, you know, two significant uh, eras or, or scenes in continental philosophy. In Christian theology, this shows up in the topic of sophiology, which is much more of a thing in Orthodox theology than Catholic or Protestant theology. But um, the idea there is that there is an aspect of God or almost outside of God that it has a feminine character. Um, in a way, it is identical to Mary, perhaps, kind of identical to the church, perhaps, and kind of identical to nature. And, um, but the thing about it is that it can't be captured in a uh, rational theology. So it can't be part of a theology system. There can be no clear concept of it, but theology can still gesture towards it uh, and then also sort of make the claim that only a more poetic or mystical uh, mode of access can can really really penetrate it. So it's like it's um it's 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 outside the concept. And in materialist philosophy, like the philosophies of Marx and Nietzsche and Deleuze and Lacan, who are synthesizing Marx and Nietzsche pretty much, um, the idea of difference or the real or this void being uh, outside of the concept and the effort to somehow create a concept of it anyway um, Qua, qua non-conceptual, so, you know, it's not conceptual, um, and it doesn't depend on the concept of being as, like, a sort of 
uh, point of comparison to say what it is not like that's that's seen as a very uh, like exciting idea and um, whereas Kant and Hegel tend to approach nothingness or negation or difference from the standpoint of logic they are of course using the logic of their day um, which is super super primitive like uh, like the logic that Kant and Hegel were using is pretty much the same logic that like Aristotle was using um, logic mathematical logic has advanced extraordinarily uh, during the 20th century and so philosophers like Reza Negrestani or Alan Badiou um, attempt to use a more updated account of logic to approach this same topic. Now in my view, you know, I've over and over again been fascinated by the enterprises of various continental philosophers who are approaching negation using resources from science or art or whatever to kind of define it. Um, however, generally, I tend to end up being left cold once I understand what they're trying to do. Because usually, they're sort of committing a philosophical sin. Like, we have an innate idea of nothingness, like like we can't help it, you know, it's sort of like a platonic recollection, like we can't think without using the idea of nothingness. And, um, you know, any philosophical decision about using materials to define it, you know, it's it's kind of basically building a false idol and then worshipping that idol. Um, uh, I think a, a more honest approach to nothingness is to uh, really savor just how little can be said about it, and um, that has real results because um, it it means like when when you sort of put effort into really making clear just how nonsensical and um, uh, sort of abundant nothingness is or differences, um, you're awakened to a broader sense of uh, possibility. And, and the one kind of contemporary thinker who I think is pretty good about this is Quentin Mayasu. A different approach in modern contemporary-ish philosophy is to um, ignore the metaphysical question of nothingness and turn usually end up you end up employing psychoanalysis and uh, you end up discussing like an existential void so like we all have an experience of nothingness uh, which can be tied to the psychoanalytic concept of the fantasy so like this kind of feeling or sense or attitude that things would be okay if something were just different maybe out there or I, I would be worthy if I were different um, and you know there's all these themes about like man being torn between uh, you know symbolic language and the material body and that creating this rift where then we have access to the infinites and that's like this void that it's a curse because we're forced to sort of dream big in unrealistic ways uh, yet at the same time that gives us a sort of unique freedom 
uh, because we're not governed by habit like animals, but we're also not like, uh, we don't have it all figured out like angels, so we have this strange kind of ability to like trace a unique path or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, that's a very significant, important theme. Uh, again, I would just say that it's it's a bit of a false idol too. Um, th that topic I approach in uh, the sort of arena of axiology, which comes later. But, you know, I think that there is a cosmic nothingness. You know, there, there is a holy trinity that has nothing to do with um, the world, that, that would exist without the world. And that trinity seems to face something perplexing to it. And I say seems because it may in fact be, and this is a really important point because this is actually Christian dogma, that that seeming is an illusory seeming, that in fact the Holy Trinity um, has nothing wrong with it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of a mark of heresy, um, it's a mark of Gnosticism to suppose that the Trinity exists because of uh, a cosmic lack or a cosmic imbalance that then they're kind of circulating around trying to solve the problem or, um, you know, like, and, and I guess the idea is that a, a perfect God couldn't possibly have a real problem. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, I think that Christian, like, I take Christian dogma very seriously. So, in a way, that's the stance that I'm most comfortable with, uh, for sure. However, I think there's more to this story. So, uh, where, where I would really leave it with this just kind of very, like, uh, loose introduction, you know, is that what Heil means, what Heil designates, is a, uh, we could say maybe, a, a penumbra of heresy that sort of encircles the Holy Trinity, you know, and, um, like, it, at least from the perspective of theology and philosophy, you know, it's possible to suggest that there is something lacking in God, um, that there's a, a problem that God suffers, um, or that there is a divine field that's actually higher than, than God, that, that God is like a, that sort of the God that we know um, or the various gods that we know perhaps are phenomena within a sort of divine substrate that has like a higher ranking level of divinity but by that very fact is also like practically practically nothing right uh, you know the it's sort of sort of like like, like a clinamen a uh, a field of differential elements that are entirely unrelated to one another in every way. Um, and, you know, it's it's fascinating to imagine this thing. Um, in, in Badu's philosophy, you know, he's approaching this through mathematics. Um, and it's, when, when you really kind of go, go deep into, uh, a sort of project of, say, of, of using some field to make sense of this thing, um, like, when you sort of get in your mind, like, oh, yeah, like, uh, like, imagine, so, like, so, like, set theory has a couple of, like, stop gaps, uh, that are axioms that are there just to make things work, to, like, stop contradictions from happening, and so, like, 
you imagine, oh, there's some kind of field where the contradictions are actually just there, you know, where, where like, or where like the program halts or something like that. Um, and it's like, you can sort of have a certain epiphany in, like another one is like the Chaitin number. Uh, uh, Ray Brassier likes this, like, like it's like a number that's so large that um, it, it like inherently can't be, uh, can't be computed, you know, or even, I mean, even like thinking about an irrational number like pi. So, you know, famously pi, along with almost all numbers, by the way, uh, is a decimal number and it's non-repeating. So there's no way to uh, exhaust what pi is. There's no way to fully write it down. Like you, when you describe it, it just keeps going. That, that that split between uh, its being and its representation, um, you know, that that gives some kind of hint of what of what Heil is kind of. The last thing I'll say is that if there were one divinity in any tradition that seems to like be or manifest what I'm talking about, it would be. Vajrayogini in Tibetan Buddhism and um, she's this like very kind of like fierce and scary goddess who is recognized as like the kind of queen like she's kind of sort of like the highest um, of like all gods and and that, that that's the thing about this entity is that it's like you know, it's beyond, it's beyond love. It's not loving. And so Ololan is also feminine. Ololan is a member of the actual Trinity, but Ololan is like, she literally is love. Um, and, and the arc work, you know, uh, is, is the work of love. And, 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 but Haya, but Hawk has lots of love too, kind of, I mean, I won't get into, I'll save the Trinitarian stuff for the passage on the Trinity, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a scary dimension of God, and, uh, and the church may have good reason for denying that it's even there, uh, but, you know, hasn't been proven to me. The key practical uh, relation to this thing, the, the key practical point to make, I think, is that there are two possible attitudes towards Heil, towards nothingness. One is uh, to experience it as a lack um, as something missing, as something wrong, as something that isn't fitting, that isn't working. And, uh, you know, that would be the kind of like maybe existential starting point that most of us are in. And when one becomes spiritually awakened, it becomes possible to turn around and experience that same nothingness as a gift um, as as something that is like very fecund and ripe and um, and actually a source of like emancipation or liberation because it means that like all like meaning cages uh, can kind of be broken through so that that's nothingness.